This is Kandahar Air Base, the staging post for the war in Afghanistan. With 10,000 flights a month transporting troops and supplies to the front line day and night. It's also a melting pot of nationalities, with soldiers and civilians from 35 different countries, all inside the wire. They have to get on and get their laughs where they can. Because life in the war zone is about to hot up. Right, I just got a flash off a mirror from my one o'clock. Someone's signaling they know what we're doing, basically. Security is a top priority on an airbase in the middle of a war zone. A thousand Afghan workers come in and out every day to do jobs like cleaning. They've got to be thoroughly searched. Any one of them could be a suicide bomber. The base commander, Bob Judson's, come to inspect the front gate with his entourage. Always well looked after. The Canadian forces guard the main entry point, and Bob's in charge of them. This is pretty much the front line. We rely very heavily on the work done here, so that most of the time, at least, it's a relatively relaxed environment inside the base. But NATO's got good reason to let the Afghans in. You're trying to help them economically, to help them understand what we're here to do, but are all of them 100% on our side? No, I'm not naive enough to believe that. And there's actually a bit of a saying that you can rent an Afghan, but you can't buy one. Obviously, we're careful because of that with locally employed civilians, how much they see, how much they get to know. Uh, operational security is something that is you know, foremost in everybody's mind here. And take a look at the contraband store. Of course, sir. That's Every day, the Canadians confiscate a pile of household items. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. The menagerie. Duct tape. Matches, pack of matches was the big deal. Lights a fuse. You just you can't take any chances. Clocks and things are a, a real risk. I mean, obviously, they're timer devices then for, uh, for use in uh, explosive devices. We've actually seen a, a gentleman uh, sneak a, an alarm clock in his pants. And luckily for us, the actual alarm went off when he was in the line. <laughs> There are 1,500 foreign workers living on the base, and every so often they get a surprise visit from the British military police. Today we are searching a contractor a compound in order to find any items that could be deemed prejudicial to force protection at Kandahar Airfield. Police Chief John Hipkins is leading an inspection of tool sheds belonging to 30 Filipino labourers. One of the things that we are allowed to do is force protection searches, which in you know just it's exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, we make sure that the contractors are not in possession of something which could damage the force in any way. That booze. These random searches don't go down well. When you start to impinge on people's lives in a particular fashion that they don't like, you're not going to be popular. So a military policeman needs a thick skin. Uh, and you put up with a good-natured jibes. And obviously those jibes which are not good-natured, you have powers to do something about anyway. They don't allow any alcohol on base at all. But some people will try anything. Somebody's been brewing booze, I think. You smell that? Yeah, it like it's yeah, it's alcohol, but it's um, pretty much empty. Other items we found is uh, military publications. Um, we found quite a large quantity, believe it or not, of sex toys. Dresses in, uh, in male accommodation, that's quite a favourite. Knuckle dusters, it's really the whole gambit, you know. Today's search has come up with all sorts of stuff, including a bullet. We've got one 50 cal round, which 
which was found in the guy's room. He's found it and obviously thought, right, I'll keep that as a little memento. It's still alive. Uh, the percussion cap's not been struck. Uh, so we're going to get this disposed of yeah, yeah. through the uh, ammo technicians. And another find? British uniforms. There is no purpose why he's got this stuff. It has been known in this theatre of operations whereby insurgents have dressed themselves as, um, as Afghan National Police. Um, it's not beyond the rounds of possibility to suggest that individuals can do likewise as, you know, acting as a Brit. The builder's now under investigation. That's worrying, you know, uh, for the obvious reason. The 400-mile area outside the airfield is guarded by the RAF regiment. One squadron's just started their tour of duty, and 25 of them are out on patrol, heading to a nearby village to get to know the locals. 30-year-old Sergeant Bennett Jones, known as Jonesy, is the new acting flight commander. A hell of a lot more responsibility, mate, hell of a lot. Uh, a lot more to do with the planning phase, but um, I enjoy doing it. And his first job's a hearts and minds mission. So he's meeting the head man. He's a farmer, but I just don't have his age. Do, can you tell me how? It's all colour. Sir, the new colour. 29. 29. 29? I'm older than him. Is it a family shadow? It's a family shadow. 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 It's because you didn't work hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had an easy life. I'm telling you, no, mate, I ain't. <laughs> right, come on, glass of stuff on. It's new recruit Nathan Chulls' first time abroad. It makes you think that your house at home isn't that really that bad. <laughs> Even if it is just a fucking one bedroom flat or whatever it is. Look what these people live in. It's fucking horrendous. Does make you think. No electricity or nothing, mate. You'd be lucky if they got a well in the village. Now, this village doesn't have a water source at all. Now, the only way they get water into the village is uh, making, basically, breaking uh, irrigation channels through a water source to here. Jones is going to make the head man an offer. What I would like him to do for me. It's shown me the best place where the well would be placed for his people. In exchange for a well, the regiment wants something in return. It's all to do with hearts and minds. Obviously, if we do stuff like that, if they see people operating in the area that shouldn't be in the area, um, what normally happens, and that's happened in the past, which has helped us out massively, is they will phone what we call the watchkeeper, which will then sort of send a call sign into that area and to obviously find these people and deal with them in the appropriate manner. Jonesy starts the plans for the well and the lads get some freebies to add to their rations. Pomegranates. We don't really get our fire a day from our rat pack, so we go to the locals and give us fruit and veg. See this? OK. Come on, push on. There you go. <laughs> It's helicopter heaven at Kandahar. There are 12 different types, including the US Marines Cobra gunship, the Royal Navy's Lynx, and the Army's deadly Apache. But it's the RAF's Chinook that's the lifeline to the troops in Helmand province. At 30 meters long and weighing nearly 12 tons, it has a top speed of almost 200 miles per hour, faster than any other helicopter in Afghanistan. Not only that, its lifting power is legendary, making it the heavyweight champion of the sky. The Chinook has synchronized counter-rotating blades. They're powered by two 5,000 horsepower turbo shaft engines. On the outside, underslung loads can be hooked on, making the Chinook capable of lifting 10 family saloon cars in one go. On the inside, it's large enough to carry 55 troops, or a Land Rover, or 24 casualties on stretchers. Today, the crew's getting ready to go to Camp Bastion. Every two weeks, they have to do a four-day stint there. 
23-year-old Andy Scrace, better known as Scratchy, is the co-pilot in charge of this 10 million pound beast. When I was like in the sixth form, I knew I wanted to join the Air Force and fly and stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of buttons and dials. It does look uh, pretty confusing to start with, but um, it's actually uh, nowhere near as, as uh, complicated as it looks, really. The Chinook's packed with troops, food, ammo and supplies for Bastion. A lot of people think it's, it's big and lumbering, but you can really throw it around. Yeah, it's awesome to fly. The Chinook's an American helicopter that's been around for 50 years. It first saw action in Vietnam. The RAF used it in Northern Ireland and then the Falklands. And it's been their workhorse ever since. Bastion's only 25 miles from the combat zone in Helmand province. So for the next four days, Scratchy and his three other crew will be on call, ready to help soldiers fighting the Taliban at a moment's notice. Speaking to ground troops, most of them are pretty happy to, to see a Chinook coming and stuff like that, which is nice to know. Ready? Yeah. The Army, Navy and RAF all have troops here. So whilst they're waiting for a call out, Scratch's crew keep themselves busy by marking their territory with the Royal Air Force flag. Click over there on the left. That's the Navy ensign. See, the Navy ensign went up because we already had one. Now they've decided to have a bigger one, so we're going to have a bigger one. I hope this isn't going out because my mother's going to be very embarrassed by this. Well, I don't know, they can't get too much higher without some serious engineering work. <laughs> you know what, that's just so not going to work in a strong wind. It's fine. It's fine. fine. Until we get a strong wind, it can stay up. We're quite lucky, we've got a really good bunch of pilots and a good bunch of crewmen. Yeah, it's good. It's going to go on and on this thing. This is going to get higher, ours is going to get higher until it ends in tears, I think. Back in Kandahar, RAF physical training instructor Adam Hennessy's come up with an ambitious project. Kandahar's strongest man competition. I don't think it's been done before. And there's been fun runs organised, little charity events, but to do a strongman event, I was aware this is the first one, and then hopefully every summer from now on, there might actually be a Kandahar's strongest man running. There aren't many distractions to living in a war zone, but keeping fit is one of them. The Canadians have got their own ice rink for their national sport. You'll find the Americans playing volleyball. And the Brits play the beautiful game. Adam's mission is to get the nations competing together, and he's got the perfect location. This is what's known as the boardwalk. So we've got that big area of space at the back. We're hoping to get this all sort of booked out. We can have spectators all the way around hold the events in the centre, so hopefully it'll be quite big. Kandahar's got three huge state-of-the-art air-conditioned gyms. One Canadian, one American, and one British. Adam's come to the Canadian gym to recruit some contestants. I mean, there's even guys as skinny as me going to be competing. Oh, okay. So, okay. Under 70, uh, 175 pounds. You just yeah. want to take one? Sort of spread the word? Brilliant. Brilliant. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Thanks. You shouldn't enter because you're far too skinny and you're not as strong as me. <laughs> Get your name down. And I just want you to stand on top of it, please. Paul Strickleton, better known as Stricky, has just signed up as a contestant. He's an army rehabilitation trainer, and just helping soldiers with minor injuries back to full fitness. I love what I do because it's imperative to get the, the troops back on the road. There's commandos here, there's paras, and especially those kind of uh, soldiers with that mentality, they want to get on the ground as soon as, so they're really grateful for any help they can get. Because of his job, Stricky's got his own personal gym. See, we don't have much equipment in here, so we've got to obviously snap a broom up handling off and then just a few weights that I got together from, a, from the gym. And we just do what we can, really. Oh, 
hopefully my, my training regime will pay off. Hopefully I'll come first. Well, I'm, I'm pretty certain I'll come first. I've got him. I absolutely got him. Right. It's all nationalities. So there's quite a lot of stake. People just see this event as a morale booster, for, which it is, clearly. But there's going to be a lot of competitiveness, without a doubt. They might be our, our close allies, but you've got to beat the Americans. Absolutely. Outside the camp, the RAF regiment is on patrol, guarding the base. And rookie Gunnar Chules is kitted out for the harsh conditions. Yeah, hell of a lot of dust. Especially on top cover. Because we're one of the last wagons back. The men are travelling in a convoy of eight vehicles. There's one Vector that's a troop carrier. Four Vixens that are lightly armoured Land Rovers. And protecting the convoy from the front, rear and sides are three heavily armed Wimmicks or weapons-mounted installation kits. Top covers provided by the rear gunner, operating a 50 caliber heavy machine gun, or HMG, which has the killing radius of five meters from over a mile away. This can be switched to a grenade machine gun that fires high explosive grenades at 340 rounds a minute. The Wimix commander sits in the passenger seat with a 7.62 millimeter general purpose machine gun. The convoy's biggest threat is going over roadside bombs, and they've come to their first vulnerable point, or VP. The squadron we took over from, yeah, they lost two lads around this area, so it's become a very important VP for us to make sure that we make sure that we do it properly. All clear. Then Wimmick Commander Jay Hudson spots something suspicious. Right, I just got a flash off a mirror to my one o'clock, but it looked like a mirror flash. A local national in some ruins over there, blatantly holding a mirror above his head and flashing it to the sun. It's an insurgent way of communicating with each other, so we're, we're trying to get eyes on now, see what we can do about it to stop him. He was in between there in the mound, in the ruins. She's in the ruins, Lee? Yeah. I think that's where he's gone. Do you get it, we, we call it getting dicked. Basically, someone's signaling and um, they know what we're doing, basically. The enemy's made a run for it. Because of the rules of engagement, the regiment aren't allowed to shoot. You've always got to be careful them because one of these could be a signal to actually fucking start an ambush or start of an IED. Do you know what I mean? To signaling to someone that that convoy is in position and bang. On the airbase, a sombre ceremony is being held on the runway for three Canadian engineers who were killed when their vehicle went over a roadside bomb ten miles outside the base. The commander, Bob Judson, is overseeing the final farewell before they're flown back home. We pause the operation for these. We try and have a quiet hour a bit of a peace to allow a bit of introspective thought. It's emotional. Uh, it's always emotional. You're, you're literally watching these very young men generally and burying the coffins of their friends. You've got to allow the guys to grieve, uh, and they do, uh, and it's deeply emotional. You can't fail to be touched by that. I'd like to, to tell you that I've only been to one or two of these in the, uh, in the time I've been here. I haven't. I've lost count of the number of these ramp ceremonies I've been to. They really do bring home the realities of war, especially to those that are here on the base who don't get off the base and don't get perhaps as close to being in harm's way as many of the troops do who are out very much on the front line. They're all, all sad and regrettably you must, for the sake of your own, uh, own sanity really, you must put it behind you and, uh, and move on and continue with the mission.
After 14 hours on patrol, the regiment find a spot to camp for the night. And then it's time to get out the ration packs. To be honest, I'd rather be eating some Sunday roast back in the UK, but put the ammo tin on there because you can fit more rations and cook more people's food at once. It's the most dangerous thing we do. Oh, oh, well well What's your arm? No. Curries. Drink with sponge pudding. It's like a brick in syrup. It's not gourmet, but it's a balanced meal of fat, proteins and carbs in a bag. Fuck it burns. <laughs> giving the lads about 5,000 calories a day. I've gone for the old steak and vegetables today. Steak and veg? It's the fucking best one. You're lucky I gave that a look. Big spoonful there. It's like baby food. Packed full of calories, so it keeps you going. It tastes like shit, though. We got roast duck in um, wine sauce. <laughs> <laughs> After a stressful day, the soldiers of the RAF can finally relax for the first time. This is why I signed up. Top Gun, what a film. Yeah. <laughs> it's Top Gun without aeroplanes. Yeah. And without the, uh, uh, the good-looking women everywhere. Right? <laughs> I, could, I couldn't think of it anywhere else I'd rather be. <laughs> Even their Afghan interpreter joins in the fun. <laughs> and he talked to him about his family and his wife and, and um, the Taliban actually shot his dad just because he works with us and with the forces shit he's um, 19 time to turn in two men stay on lookout with thermal imaging cameras is it hard to stay awake? it can get yeah but you just got to remember that if you fall asleep, then well, that's probably when the shit will hit the fan. And the rest of the patrol get their heads down, wherever they can. This is my roof, mate. Daybreak in the Afghan desert. The RAF regiment's been on patrol, camped out all night, and the temperatures dropped to five degrees. Morning. Charles has been wrapped up. Thermal gloves and a thermal hat, and my head over in my sleeping bag. But I was, I was actually warm. I was warm. It was only my eyes that were cold. <laughs> that bit of a face. It is at the moment quarter past six. Now you see the lights just sort themselves out, take off their suits. This is the start pretty much of the winter months. The rains are not started yet as well. And, uh, they're pretty much like monsoon rains here. Uh, the whole of this area will just become a swamp. Guarding Kandahar Air Base is a tough job, and it's getting to Jonesy. Sometimes when you walk in the mess, some RF officer, oh, why are you two so scruffy? Well, because I've just been out on the ground for four days, sir. And he's like, well, you should look neater. It's like, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, okay, you got to do it. There you go. Protecting a fucking holiday camp. At least Chules has managed to get out of bed on the right side. Look at that. I get to wake up to that every morning. It's one of the things I actually enjoy, waking up and go to sleep with the moon and the stars. They're heading back to the airbase, and there's a big day ahead. BFBS Radio, the strongest man in Kandahar competition, which has been held today, this afternoon. It's at the boardwalk, starts at two o'clock, and promises to be a great few hours entertainment. Get yourself along. RAF fitness instructor Adam Hennessy wants to get all the nations competing together and take their minds off the war just for an afternoon. Quite excited about it, a little bit nervous, but um, everything seems to be coming together quite well at the moment. I mean, it's just coming up half past ten. Uh, got most of the uh, events set up, ready to go. I'd love to enter, but unfortunately, because it's my idea, I have to be the one to officiate it. 
Adams had to make do with what he can find around the base for props. He's managed to blag a spare tyre for the tyre flip. It is quite heavy. I'll probably guess around sort of 200 pounds. That is a, a plug from a bullet hole, so that's why we can have them. So, <laughs> authentic Afghan war tyres. One of the favourites to win the contest is Army rehabilitation trainer Stricky. And he's just warming up. And that's it. <sighs> Being the winner in Kandahar, strongest man. Like lightweight category, that's the one. It's all mine, I tell you. Show off. Kandahar's luxury compared to other camps like Bastion. It's got 80 shower blocks with hot and cold running water. Walk clean, do a little pair of towels, a little. Uh, always stocked up on, on uh, toilet rolls, very clean and tidy. The guys in the field, I can, all, I can only apologise, they're just so lucky, really. But yeah, everyone's got a job to do, I suppose. And mine is to get clean. <laughs> now, where's that soap? <laughs> so yeah, we're going to adopt a shit policy where you, you put the water on, yeah. get yourself what, washed, uh, mass massage in the old uh, shower gel, and then put the water back on to wash it off just to save water. But there's no water shortage at the brand new laundry that's got over 100 washing machines and 200 dryers that turn around 12 tonnes of washing a day. It's run by Portuguese manager Antonio and he's just getting used to the smell. It's like dirty socks, you know what I mean? You keep dirty socks in your room for a few days, it's going to start smelling. Well here, we're talking about 2,000 bags being here, you know? So the concentration of dirty clothes is just uh, amazing. <laughs> Before the laundry opened, it was all do-it-yourself. Now everyone's allowed to get two bags of washing done a week for free. Dryer, it's very hot here. And when it's 50 or 60 degrees outside in the, in the summertime, it's, uh, it's almost unbearable. The only thing is good is this place here is good in winter time. So it's like minus 10, so here you're, you're quite all right. First off, every item of clothing searched and they come up with some explosive finds. So you have here the bullet box, you know, and this is when we find stuff. If this goes in the dryer, with the heat, it may, it may blow up and then, you know, it has no trajectory, so, you know, if you're in front of it and the side of it, if it comes out the machine and it hits one of the workers, then, you know, the soldiers should be aware that this is, is fatal, and it's simple as that. To get through the mountains of washing, Antonio employs a staff of 150, Christians from Kenya. Yeah, it's good money compared to back home. It's really good money. I get to learn about uh, different cultures and uh, make friends all over the world. We have Nepalese, we have Filipinos, uh, we have Indians, we have uh, Sri Lanka, and we have uh, just a few now. We start taking uh, people from Bangladesh. Yeah. Antonio's rightly proud of what they do. I could only imagine the guys that go on the field, you know what I mean? And they've been there for a week. But imagine you come back, you take a nice shower and you have nice clean clothes that's clean. So I mean, uh, what you do for yourself, you want to do it for the other guys. Thank you very much. That's it. It's as easy as that. Thanks a lot. The finishing touches are being made to the strongman course. Can you all aim me at the tents? 60 competitors are signed up. And one of them's Big Mac, an RAF truck driver. Mac's been training for the last month, carrying everything but the kitchen sink in 35 degree heat. I've decided to go jogging with my body armour. I was told by a friend if I wore the body armour, I'd lose a lot more water, so obviously I'd sweat more. I've got a rucksack on, I put 40 kilograms in it, and I'm running with that to try and build my leg muscles up, uh, trying to get myself a lot fitter than what I am. Under his harsh regime, he's managed to lose a stone in a month, but will it be enough to take the title? I'm not going to say I'm going to come top because there's some big lads out there competing. A lot of them, obviously, uh, are gym bunnies, and they go to the gym quite often, more, more or less two, three hours a day. So I'm hoping to come in at least within the top ten. 
Liquid soap for washing machine? Liquid soap for washing, that's very uh, popular and unfortunately it's a popular item we don't have. One of the eldest competitors is 48-year-old Alain Baudouin, a civilian who runs the Canadian corner shop. The worst case scenario is that you get a bar of soap, some hot water and, and do it yourself. I've been training for the last two or three weeks, so I've been flipping tires and carrying dumbbells and doing everything that needs to be done to be able to compete. But um, hopefully we're all gonna have fun in the spirit of friendship and, and uh, the reason why we're here, we're gonna have a great time with that. Alain is seven weeks into a six month break from his real job as a customs officer in Montreal. I thought it would be an interesting experience to come here and just be with his troops. Sometimes there's a level of comfort in knowing that the person that's actually serving you is somebody from your hometown. If they need a shoulder to cry on or somebody to talk to, um, we're all there for them. Over at the RAF regiment, Sean, one of their mechanics, is a late contender. I only entered the competition about an hour ago, so I've not really had long. Currently holding ammo boxes out at arm's length and training for the Kandahar Strongest Man. His odds are about as big as his biceps. I think I've been holding them uh, about a minute and a half. Yeah, slowly starting to hurt. Yes. Ninety miles away at Bastion, the Chinook's been called to make a delivery to the combat zone. Everything south of about the 68. Point this area here. 23-year-old Scratchy is the co-pilot. In a moment's notice, you've got to be in the aircraft flashing it up and um, heading out to somewhere which could be potentially pretty hot. I guess all the training kicks in and you, um, you just get on with it. They're travelling from Bastion to Lashkagar, 25 miles from the camp. Their mission is to take a two-ton communication tower to the Marine Commando's base there. It's the job of Loadmaster Mike to guide the pilot onto the underslung load. The pilots can see, yeah, you know, good to the side and below and to the front, but they can't see anything behind them. So we do what we call uh, voice marshalling. We voice marshal the aircraft over the load, pick the load up. And away they go into the combat zone. You can't switch off for a second, really, because, um, I mean, when you're that low, you've got to keep your eyes out and keep looking ahead. And Mike's watching from behind, the Taliban aiming AK-47 rifles. That's when we're most vulnerable, certainly to small arms. It doesn't take much for someone to stick their AK in the air as you fly over the top, so you're looking out for that all the time. The Chinooks armed with two M134 six-barreled miniguns at each front side window capable of 60 rounds per second. On the back ramp, Mike, or one of the loadies, operates an M60D machine gun. After dropping their load, they land a few meters away. You've got the heat from the engines and you've got the downwash from the aircraft itself picking up this dust and heat and it's just an incredible experience. Marines from 4-2 Commando are going to hitch a ride back to Bastion and they've got a lot of kit. The Chinook is most vulnerable to attack when it's on the ground, so it's Mike's job to make sure the pickups are fast. Flapping doesn't do anyone any good. You're really controlling the whole situation. You're keeping the captain informed of how the loading's going because he can't see down the back. He's probably sat up there getting a bit twitchy about the length of time we've been sat on the ground. A couple of months ago, someone took a round through the front of the cockpit and landed about a foot away from the guy who was in the left-hand seat, so that's fairly close. As soon as you can, get the ramp up, get secure, and give the clear above and behind. That's the cue to the pilot to get out of there. It's 2 p.m. at Kandahar Air Base, and strongman contestant Stricky's being weighed in. I need a nervous poo big time. 
No, it was Pete. Oh, Mate, shit it. Dirt and back. Well, you see, if this was baby blue and that had a bit of an eagle above it, oh, oh, it yeah. Air Force Whatever. PCI, you'd be able to breeze this. Loser. My strength. Have you seen my little fan base over there? And the Brits need all the support they can get, because Canadian Troy Goodfellow has just arrived. Look at the size of him. <laughs> He's one big bastard. I'm near beer. It's stiff competition, but Max not bothered. Yeah, there's some big guys here. They've obviously been training, taking a lot of supplements in as well. So have they got the strength there at the end of the day, or does it just look like they've got the strength here at the end of the day? Corner shop contestant Alain isn't so confident. Maybe a bit off more than I could chew, but we'll see. <laughs> hoping for the best. I was kind of hoping there'd be an over 45 club. Three, two, <laughs> They're off on the first event, carrying 25 kilos of water in each hand. <laughs> Late entrant Sean's feeling the strain. That's got to hurt. I slipped. <laughs> Wasn't the best tactics, to be honest, man. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, I'm bollocks. Need a fag. He's doing very well. It's the support, I reckon. Just yeah. getting him through it. <laughs> getting him through it. <laughs> But Troy's showing what he's made of. Pure brawn. Watch it up! Did it back! Hurt me arms. <laughs> Can I straighten his arms? I uh, shouldn't have worn the gloves because I had no grip whatsoever. Put your heart down. That's my two worst events out of the way. I've come back now and smash it, hopefully. Well, to be honest, I don't think anyone's thinking of the war at the minute. So I'm achieving my job. Go, Sean! For last place, it's a tug of war between Sean and 48 year old Alain. Good result. <laughs> Very good result. <laughs> no prizes for guessing the winner. Odds on favourite, Troy. UK guys are fucking tough. And runner up, Stricky. <laughs>
offers a few surreal distractions to the wall. And the Thai massage parlour is definitely one of them. This is all my girl over here. Um, and they're all from Thailand, so they know what they're doing. Toy and her team of six masseurs brought a touch of the Orient to the airbase two years ago. If you look at the outside and you are not the world, you can just walk in and you just forget where you are. The Army's strongman runner-up Stricky is in need of some muscle relief. No better day to spend my Sunday morning getting a, a Thai massage, I think, so just, just rub those aches and niggles out of my body. They don't do extras, I'm afraid. Well, so I've been told. I'll, I'll ask when it's my turn in a minute. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> but yeah, no, nah, I think, I think it, apparently if you ask, you get, you get bollocked, so I'm not even going to attempt it. It's like ordering a Chinese. Could I have um, a deep tissue massage, please? I can't believe I'm on operational tour and again a time massage and it's just it's amazing. It's just it's unbelievable. Charles and his mate Fergie have some downtime too. I didn't trust myself getting a massage. You know what I mean? No. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> don't ask. Yeah, don't ask. But something else has caught his eye. This is Burger King. Doesn't look like it's open. When do you open? Four days. Four days. We'll be off patrol in four days. And we'll be on leave. And we can come back and get a burger from Burger King. In Afghanistan, who would have thought it? <laughs> it's like a, two burgers, a load of chips, and a, a little bit of lettuce on the side to make it feel better. Jonesy's just got mail from his fiance, who's expecting their first baby. No pair of socks. Yeah, that there's the, the latest scan picture of my little girl. Uh, it's a bit hard to obviously make out, but you know she's there, and she's always pretty cool. <laughs> I count down the days now, and uh, the closer it gets, the more excited I get. I mean, anybody that's had, the, obviously, a child probably understands the feeling of it, and especially, again, that I'm away, it's a bit more exciting. You know, I'm just dying to get home. Um, that's it, really. I'm just, you know, I can't wait. Next time on Warzone, the camp gets camper. Ooh, the big fight group for charity. The Chinooks pick up casualties from the front line. and the regiment comes under attack again. But this time, it's serious. Four and a half tons of women that's been blown 15 feet to the side of the road. We have one man trapped underneath that vehicle at the moment. It makes me fucking really angry. They're just fucking cowards.